Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series on international investment law and policy. Today, we will discuss the termination and renegotiation of bilateral investment treaties. My name is Natalie Bernasconi, and I head the Economic Law and Policy Program at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, or in short, IISD. I am very pleased to moderate this webinar today. First of all, I hope that you and your families are staying healthy and safe in this time of crisis. This unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic is shaking up the globalized world as we know it. A wide range of economic activity has simply come to a halt. The crisis shows us both the need for international cooperation, as well as the fragility of international governance systems. At the same time, some of us are able to stay connected in this time of crisis, even if just virtually. Some of us are continuing to work from our homes and connect with colleagues across the world. This webinar is such an occasion, with government officials and others joining from across the globe. As negotiations and international travel slow, slow down or are even put on hold, this is perhaps a good time to take stock of our investment frameworks to address weaknesses and build more robust frameworks. Frameworks that will support governments in a post-crisis world and help rebuild sustainable and resilient economies. The termination of outdated treaties is one step towards a new international investment governance framework. This will be the focus of our discussion today. I'm very pleased to welcome our three speakers today. First, Hamid El Khadi, a senior investment policy advisor at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD. Then we'll turn to Suzy Nikiema, Senior International Law Advisor with IISD, and then Sarah Bruin, also an inter in Investment Law Advisor at IISD. But before we turn to our speakers, I would like to share a few housekeeping rules. After the presentations by our three speakers, we will be hosting a Q&A session and we invite you to submit your questions in writing throughout the presentations. You can type them into the webinar chat function available on the right-hand side of your screen or via the chat button on the bottom toolbar. If we have insufficient time to address all the questions, we are happy to continue the discussion bilaterally after the webinar. We very much look forward to your questions. Now let's turn to Hamid. Hamid, UNCTAD has worked extensively on the reform of international investment agreements and you have developed policy frameworks and action plans. Why is reform so important? important? The floor is yours, Hamid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, important webinar. Thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you also for your very important uh, question. Um, UNCTAD has been for many years now supporting uh, governments um, attempting to reform their international investment uh, frameworks. Um, we have been seeing um, lately a number of cases, for example, investor state dispute cases arising out of uh, measures that countries have taken, uh, often legitimate measures uh, taken for the protection of uh, the public interests, for example. It's also very natural to uh, start thinking uh, about modernizing treaties, 
uh, rules that have been negotiated 20 or 30 or even 50 years ago. Um, this is just something normal to do. Um, many of these treaties, and I would even say the overwhelming majority of these treaties, uh, no longer reflects today uh, the interests, the objectives, the priorities of countries. Um, treaties are actually um, making it harder for countries to adopt measures that are in line with sustainable development objectives. Um, treaties um, include very broadly drafted provisions, um, include um, um, for example, the definition of investment is extremely broad. You have provisions uh, such as fair and equitable treatment and indirect expropriation that are unrefined, unqualified, and all that exposes states uh, to investor state disputes. Um, now, of course, if the state is implementing measures that are discriminatory, or that is an obvious expropriation, that's, that's not a problem. These are the rules of the game, that there is an ISDS system. The problem arises when a state is trying or is implementing measures that it deems necessary for the protection of public health, public the environment, uh, labor standards. And we have seen numerous cases um, happening like that. Now, um, what to do uh, in, in, these, in these circumstances? Uh, we have developed policy tools. Uh, we also um, help countries directly with technical assistance and capacity building in, for example, drafting new model investment treaties, and we call them new generation investment uh, treaties. Um, we have also our um, investment policy framework for sustainable development, uh, which is available online. And in the annex, uh, it provides policy options for investment treaty negotiators uh, wishing to draft uh, more balanced, more modern treaties that reflects the realities um, of today. We also have um, combined all of our efforts in our reform package uh, for the international investment regime, uh, which also includes 10 uh, practical and actionable options uh, for countries wishing to reform their investment uh, treaties. And this webinar is particularly relevant in this context because one of the options uh, is the termination of treaties. And of course, you might, um, you might think, well, how can a termination um, is part of reform? Um, well, termination can be part of reform and should be part of reform because countries are basically terminating um, the constraints uh, that they have um, um, signed on to uh, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, when the world was a very different place. Um, countries are now, um, or globally, it's no longer a north-south issue, um, ranging from the US to Canada to EU, in Africa, in the ASEAN region, in Latin America. There's a, there's a global almost consensus that a treaty um, should be uh, drafted in a clearer manner, should have more precise objective, objectives, uh, a treaty should also not be only about investment protection. I mean, if you look at a treaty from uh, 19, um, the 90s, for example, or the 80s, you will see that the 10-page document is solely on the protection of investors. Um, there is an absence of, of key and crucial uh, uh, issues that are important today, such as the facilitation of investment, an absence of reservations or flexibility mechanisms, an absence of provisions allowing the state uh, to implement their duties to regulate investments. I mean, now some of the treaties include a provision saying that the state has the right to regulate. But of course, the state has the right to regulate. That's why we have states and governments. It's to regulate. So instead of, of, of begging for the right to regulate, um, treaties should actually reaffirm the right of the state, the duty of the state to regulate investments 
in their territory in order to ensure a win-win situation. So it's very important to distinguish between the termination of a treaty and jumping very quickly and saying, oh, look, this, this country is now a protectionist country. This is really uh, something that has been happening, unfortunately, and this is completely wrong because many countries or most countries that are terminating their treaties are actually doing it with a view to modernize their legal frameworks. I will give you an example. Uh, for example, all these new regional investment treaties, the African Investment Protocol, which is going to be under negotiations very soon. Um, some of the EU um, free trade agreements with third countries. Um, <clears throat> some of the, um, um, all of these new regional investment treaties have a provision in them uh, that terminate the existing treaty, the existing bilateral investment treaties between the member countries. And that is to create more harmony, um, a more um, uh, simplified and, and clear investment framework instead of building one treaty on top of, um, of another. So terminations uh, are, can be part of reform. Um, we also have to keep in mind that, uh, as you all know, the legal framework is not only about investment treaties. You have state contracts, and God knows what, are, what is in the state contracts. So investors are uh, protected with state contracts. They are protected with national rules and legislations, plus the regional investment treaties and bilateral investment treaties. So terminating treaties with a view to put your house in order and to have a more modern regulatory framework should not or cannot be criticized um, uh, as a country turning into um, protectionism, especially today with all these global crises that we are seeing today. Um, I mean, start in the environment crisis, the climate change, now this global pandemic. Um, now more than ever, really, um, as you said, Natalie, countries should be allowed um, to build more robust frameworks. And I think by robust framework, I mean, or I would think about, it means frameworks that provide a balance between maintaining investor protection, but unlike the 90s, creating also a new dimension, which is ensuring that states cannot, cannot, can no longer be uh, impeded or restricted when they implement measures that are clearly designed for the public interest even if these measures will affect negatively a certain percentage of investors' profitability. Um, I, I, I yeah, think yeah. this, yeah, thank you, Natalie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, for that uh, great overview, Hamid. Um, and, and just very, very briefly, if you had to just name a few options available for countries to reform uh, just very broadly, could you just name a few? Because this is, of course, always to be seen. The, the question on termination needs to be seen in, in, in the broader uh, reform uh, optic. Yes, um, thank you, Natalie. So I think um, for those of you uh, who are interested, um, you can note down on uh, page 76 of UNCTAD's a reform package, which is of course publicly available online. Uh, we have identified 10 options for the reform of, of uh, investment treaties. And just very briefly, these are to clarify the content of the treaty provision, for example, by issuing joint, um, jointly interpreting treaty provisions. That's I think what India has been doing uh, for some time. Countries can also amend the treaty provisions. So instead of terminating the whole thing, you can amend certain provisions while maintaining the rest. Um, you can substitute a new treaty for an old one. Um, there's also the possibility of consolidating uh, the IIA regime um, by abrogating two or more old uh, IIAs between parties, for example, and replacing them with a new regional investment treaty. Um, managing relationships between coexisting treaties, that's also extremely important. 
and then referencing global standards, engaging multilaterally, which what is happening now at various multilateral fora, including UNCITRAL, for example. Countries can also abandon uh, unratified old treaties. There are many countries who have signed treaties from 1980s, 1990s, and these treaties never entered into force. So instead of letting them hang in there, and obviously they are outdated now, you can simply abandon these treaties. And option number nine is what we are talking about today. Well, of course, together with the uh, renegotiation option is to terminate the existing old treaties. Um, and so these options are available on, on, on our reform package on page 76. And I would be very happy um, if any of the participants have a follow-up question either to answer through the chat or later on by, by email, and I will uh, probably ask um, at the end that my email be put in the chat box. Uh, Perfect. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, thank you very much, Hamid. And just uh, in, in case you don't have the screen open in front of you, we do have a, a link uh, to your uh, for, to UNCTAD's reform package that people okay. can um, consult uh, on on page 60, I don't know what you said, 67 <laughs> uh, around there. It's, I think it's easy to find to find the overview and to read up uh, on these reform options. But as you say, uh, definitely in one way or another, uh, there is a strong link uh, and elements that require some kind of termination or what we also refer to as abrogation. Um, and that is what uh, we at IISD thought we had to uh, examine a little bit more closely, uh, also because the way to, to terminate treaties and what the law is surrounding termination uh, is sometimes not, in, not very complex, but it can vary from treaty to treaty and it's important to understand the different types of approaches that treaties have been using uh, in terms of uh, termination. And so that is why uh, we thought this webinar would be very useful for, for listeners. And also uh, we wanted to present a paper that we just published recently to help uh, sort of navigate uh, the different ways that investment treaties deal with termination and what countries have done in this respect. So thank you again, Hamed, and I'd like to go to uh, Dr. Susie Nikiema now. Uh, Susie, can you give us a little bit of uh, an overview, an introduction into this issue around the termination of investment treaties? Uh, thank you, Natalie. Sure. And hello, everyone. So my name is Susie, and it's a pleasure for me to participate to this webinar today. Uh, basically, I will briefly introduce the general context uh, related to termination of BITs, while taking the opportunity to clarify some few key concepts. And then my colleague Sarah will present in more details the options available to states and the consideration uh, to be taken into account when a state decides to terminate uh, a treaty. Uh, next slide, please. Next one. Thank you. So uh, I will start with some few figures to illustrate what Hamed just mentioned. Yes, terminating a BIT is no longer an extraordinary action. Uh, you may note that in 2017, um, um, this year was a turning point because for the first time, the total number of effective termination of treaties 22 exceeded the total number of new treaties completed, 18, uh, according to ANCTA the database. Um, it can also be noted that uh, 308 investment treaties were terminated uh, by the end of 2019 uh, as a total number. Next, please. Um, so one can expect that this trend will intensify in the coming years. There are at least three main reasons for that. First, more and more countries are becoming aware of the problems associated with traditional or all BITs and investor state disputes um, settlement system and want to address them. Another reason is that several regional blocs are revising their approaches to investment treaties 
And these new approaches could mean ultimately terminating uh, BITs concluded between member states of a single organization, what we are calling usually intra-BITs. Uh, why? Because either uh, these intra-BITs can be considered uh, to be in conflict with relevant community law. This is the case, for example, at the EU, uh, European Union level, or because maybe a new regional instrument under negotiation will likely replace intra-BIT BITs. Uh, this may be the case of the African Union, uh, where an investment protocol is under uh, negotiation, as mentioned by Hamet. A third reason uh, might be that at multilateral uh, level, uh, some reform, some ongoing reforms, such as Institutional Working Group 3 on uh, investor state dispute settlement reform, may want to consider multilateral or plurilateral termination of all BITs. So we think that it's really important to provide states considering to terminate a BIT with information of recent trends, as well as option and recommendation on how to proceed with termination. Uh, it's important to understand the legal technicalities, but also the strategies available, not only because you need to comply with the law, but also you need to anticipate, anticipate and manage some policy consideration. Next slide, please. So what are the key term and concept to understand uh, talking about termination as we are use it in the, the paper? First of all, under the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaty, it's important to remind that a treaty can be terminated either in accordance with the term of the treaty or at any time by consent by the parties. Therefore, the first place to start is to look at the term of the treaty itself. And bilateral investment treaties typically include what we call termination clause and survival clauses. And you have two main types of termination clause. Under what we call in the paper a tacit renewal termination clause, a treaty has an initial term of, let's say, for example, 10 years. And for the last six months of that 10 years term, there is a window, a window of time during which each party can terminate the treaty. And if this window is missed, the treaty automatically renew for another 10 years. And the window of terminating won't open again until six months before the end of that term. So this is the, the, the clauses with a window approach. We have a second uh, model, uh, what we are calling, uh, we call fixed term termination clause. Under this, uh, this model, each party can terminate the treaty any time after the expir expiry of the first term. However, this category of termination clause require often one year notice. So meaning the termination does not take effect immediately at the date of the notice of termination, but one year later. Finally, you have to also understand what is a survival clause. Sometimes it's called a zombie clause. And uh, yes, which is a quite scary, but why uh, we call it like that? Because this clause allows established investor in the country to continue to bring claims under a terminated treaty for a set of period, usually 10 or 15 years. And it should be noted that investment treaties are typical, atypical sorry, in the treaty universe because they are organizing their own survival after their extinction. And this is quite unusual. You can find example of formulation of these uh, clauses uh, in, in the paper uh, when you have a chance to if you, you want more detail. Next, uh, please. Um, I just want to share some few statistics here also uh, regarding the model of uh, termination clauses and the survival clause. So the majority of treaties use the fixed term termination clause model. So approximately 60% according to UNTA database. And this means here that these treaties, at least for these treaties, party uh, do not have to worry about the risk of missing a termination window. 
At the same time, the majority of survival clauses provided uh, in the treaties um, provide for a survival period of 10 years. But you can find some DITs going as far as 15 uh, years or even 20 years. Next slide, please. Well, having said that, new trends are emerging and it's important to be aware of them as well. Uh, indeed, when you're negotiating a treaty or just uh, negotiating a treaty with a new partner, it's useful to learn from the past mistakes to not reproduce the same problematic clauses. And termination and survival clauses are part of them. So, for example, it's possible to reverse the tacit renewal of a treaty unless notification of termination with tacit termination unless notification to renew it. So this is a, a complete reverse of the approach. This, this is what India has done in its new model BIT in 2016. Also in their BIT concluded the same year, Nigeria and Morocco uh, also um, uh, allowed for unilateral termination at any time with only six months notice. Well, as regarded to the survival clause, some countries have simply decided to delay it in the new treaties, uh, as in the Brazilian Cooperation and Facilitation Investment Agreements, or the Nigeria-Morocco BIT. Some countries prefer to keep the survival clause in the new treaties or renegotiated one, but reduced its duration. For example, in the Indian model, it was reduced to five years. Next one, please. Thank you. So uh, I want now to explain that there are several ways and combination used by states so far to terminate BITs. I will just go briefly here because Sarah will go into detail uh, about each option. But you can, um, the first option, uh, you can consider terminate unilaterally in a BIT or doing so by consent. You can also decide to renegotiate a new treaty or just to not replace the new one, uh, the old one, sorry. But anyway, in any case, it's important to keep in mind timing. Because parties may terminate a treaty by mutual consent at any time, irrespective of the dead, deadline and notice period provided in the termination clause. But a state that wants to terminate unilateral treaty can only do so as the treaty terms permits. So this is very important to keep in mind. Let me, next slide please, uh, just take some very few examples of what you can see in the practice. Uh, one combination is terminate by consent, negotiate a new treaty, and cancel the survival clause. For example, Australia terminated by consent two old BITs, respectively with Hong Kong and Uruguay, and they replaced them with new ones in 2019. They also neutralized the survival clause. So this is one combination. Next, please. Another combination is terminate the treaty, not replace it, but neutralize the survival clause. For example, uh, we have seen several termination taking place in the context of the EU Commission, encouraging EU member states to terminate intra-EU BITs on the ground that these are unnecessary and in conflict with EU law. So recently, uh, in the EU Plurilateral Termination Treaty, the remaining intra-EU BITs will be terminated by a mutual plurilateral termination treaty, which is now awaiting for signature and ratification. And those treaties uh, are not to be replaced with new one. A third and last uh, combination, uh, next one please, um, is terminate the treaty, not replace it. I, I mean, um, terminate the treaty unilaterally, sorry, uh, not replace it, but keep the survival clause in place because 
as Sarah will explain, you can't uh, neutralize the survival clause unilaterally. Uh, as an example here, Ecuador terminated unilaterally nine BITs in 2008 with several countries, but not a negotiated new one. So I will end, next slide please. I will end uh, here with a few more uh, figures again. Uh, and uh, according to UNTA database, 26% of investment treaties have been terminated by mutual consent and replaced by a new treaty, while 28% were terminated unilaterally without a replacement treaty. Uh, one can say that this figure may indicate states' current preference among the options available to them for terminating a treaty, but this figure should not be understood as indicating that one option is better than another one. Uh, indeed, each option, uh, option has different implications and is better suited to certain situation or to the specific context of the country. So this is where I will uh, leave the floor to Sarah to present those options and considerations that should be taken into account before selecting the most appropriate one for your country when you decide to terminate it yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, that was an excellent overview. I wanted to just ask you a small question. Um, you talked about the tacit renewal clause and the risks of uh, missing the termination window and that mm -hmm. countries had to pay attention to that. Are there any special methods or precautions that states could consider to ensure that the termination notice uh, is issued within the, uh, the time limits of this window? Yes, uh, thank you, Natalie. This is a, a, an important question um, because when you consider the window uh, opportunity to terminate with a treaty, you need to consider the date, not only the date of sending the notice, officially the notice of termination to your counterpart, but also consider the date of re reception of this notice by, by the other country, especially when you are terminating unilaterally. So uh, states uh, that are subject to a termination window uh, uh, close should be careful to allow sufficient time so that the other state receives the notice within that window. So the deadline is not for when you send the notice, but when the other counterpart receives the notice. And if the notice is sent by the terminating state during the termination window, but only receive it by its partner state. After the window has closed, under some agreements, the notice may not be considered timely and effective. So this is an, an important thing to keep in mind. And uh, um, as we are provided in the document, there are some tools and tips uh, to keep track and ensure you stay within this time frame. But I, I will let Sarah uh, provide more detail on that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Susie. And um, sorry, Sarah, if I if I already asked a question of some about something you were about to address. But I think it's not a problem if we hear it more than once uh, in different ways. So Sarah, would you like to continue the presentation? As Susie set out explaining some of the recent state practices in terminating treaties, there are a number of different combinations of options that are available to states uh, that are interested in pursuing terminations as a way of reforming their old stock of treaties. And each one of these options has a number of different benefits, risks and considerations for states to weigh up. And whether one of these options is um, a good option for a given state really depends on that state's own set of circumstances and context. So the rest of this presentation will be looking more into the policy considerations and the strategic considerations behind each of these options um, based on the state's own situation. It is, however, still important to keep in mind some of the legal clauses that Susie explained to us in particular, the tacit renewal termination clause and the survival clause. Uh, 
remembering that the tacit renewal termination clause is the type of clause with the window within which termination needs to occur, and the survival clause is the zombie clause, which can be used um, by investors to bring investment claims under a terminated treaty. These two particular clauses really play into the strategy and the policy that states will need to weigh up, and they present particular risks that need to be carefully addressed. The first combination of options that I'm going to step through is terminating by consent with a replacement treaty. So terminating by consent being that both parties agree to the termination and they decide to negotiate a new treaty to replace the old one. Now, this option may in some situations be the only option available to states. Uh, and that could be the case because the initial term of the treaty has not yet run. Almost all treaties, regardless of the type of termination clause, will set down an initial term of the treaty, usually 10 or 15 years. And it's not until the end of that initial term that the option for termination be it under a tacit renewal or a fixed term termination clause, comes up. So say you have a treaty with an initial 10-year term, but at the eight-year mark, one of the states would like to terminate, then terminating by consent will be the only option in that situation. The benefit of terminating by consent with a replacement treaty is that it allows the parties to agree a way to neutralize or to shorten the survival clause. And they can do that through the text of the new treaty. So it's quite a neat way of addressing the survival clause so that it doesn't have this zombie effect that allows uh, investors to use it to bring a claim under the terminated treaty. And we saw this option be used in the example that Susie shared earlier when Australia negotiated two new treaties, one with Hong Kong and one with Uruguay. Both of those treaties were replaced by new ones, and the text of the new treaty included a provision which shortened, uh, I'm sorry, which neutralized, which cancelled out the survival clause in the older treaty. So this option is particularly appropriate or useful for parties who are relatively on the same page about the need to reform uh, and who wish to negotiate a new treaty to replace the old one uh, rather than to exit the bit system altogether. There are a couple of risks associated with this combination of options. Uh, the first is that if you have a treaty with the tacit renewal termination clause, so the, the window, um, where there are six months at the end of the first term during which termination can occur. Um, if during the negotiations for a new treaty, the clock is running on that six months, but the, the new negotiations end up dragging on and potentially not going anywhere, then that tacit renewal clause could kick in to automatically renew the old treaty uh, and then uh, if the, the negotiations for a new treaty are discontinued, then you have the situation where you are then locked into another term for the old treaty. So just something to be aware of if negotiating um, while this window is open, um, there is a risk for missing that window. Another issue that can come up under this combination of options is that there can be pressure put on the states to rush the negotiations and to rapidly conclude a new treaty even when they may not have sufficiently aligned positions. So as a matter of strategy, this option is, is a better one where, say, two states have um, each got a new model treaty and those treaties are relatively aligned um, so that new negotiations would not be um, overly long or overly complicated. The next combination of options is to terminate 
the old treaty by consent, but not to negotiate a new replacement treaty. And we saw this combination of options in the example that Susie shared earlier of the Czech Republic terminating its bits with other EU member states. Um, And this combination of options is particularly useful in the context of two states who both wish to exit the international investment protection system under BITS and instead focus on other ways of regulating investment flows in their territory. For instance, uh, investment contracts or a domestic investment code. It's also useful in a situation uh, where both states are part of a regional body that has its own intra-regional investment agreement that regulates investment flows between the two states. And in this context, it can be a way to simplify the overlapping commitments between multiple bits and that regional instrument. And in this context, parties can still agree to neutralize or to shorten the survival clause. Uh, And they can do so by consent using another type of instrument other than a new treaty. Uh, And we saw this in the case of the Czech Republic example again, where the Czech Republic and various EU states agreed in a letter uh, to terminate. And in that same letter, they agreed to cancel out the survival clause of of the old treaty. So that option is still available here, despite the fact that there's not a new treaty because the parties are doing so by consent. Um, Just to flag that this option is not likely to be um, a viable one in a situation where two states have very different approaches or very different policies for investment protection. It does uh, require some degree of alignment on these issues for this option to be a good one. I should just note that there is no required form for parties to use when agreeing to terminate a treaty by consent um, or agreeing to neutralise a survival clause. Um, International law is, is silent on the issue of form, so the parties can agree whatever format they prefer, um, be it an exchange of letters or diplomatic note, um, to express their will and intention to terminate a treaty and neutralise a survival clause. The next combination of options is for a state to terminate an old treaty unilaterally and then enter into negotiations for a new replacement treaty. Uh, This was not a combination of options that that Susie shared an example for in her presentation because there aren't uh, current public examples of this that we know of. Um, However, there are some countries that we have been working with who have taken this option. Uh, in the context of an old treaty with a tacit renewal clause, so a termination window, um, they have chosen to unilaterally terminate the old treaty um, because the window for that termination was rapidly closing. Um, and so they went down the unilateral route in that, in that case to make sure that they were able to terminate the old treaty. But then they were happy to enter into negotiations for a new treaty because that termination um, was really being done to make sure that they didn't miss the window rather than uh, any desire to exit the um, the bit system. So this can be a good option in that type of situation. And then once that old bit is terminated, um, then there's no rush for the states to enter into negotiations for a new treaty. They can carefully prepare, um, they can develop their new model, um, they can have um, pre-negotiation meetings to get um, aligned with the negotiating partner without that same sense of pressure or urgency um, because the old treaty has been terminated already. If under this option, Uh, new negotiations start, but then eventually the states find that they don't have common ground in their positions 
um, or perhaps the political circumstances in one of the states changes um, or priorities shift, there is no obligation, no binding obligation for the states to continue to conclude a new treaty because they have separated uh, or delinked the termination of the old treaty with the negotiation of a new one. However, there is um, a, a zombie clause implication here to, to flag. Um, as Susie mentioned in her presentation, states are not able to unilaterally extinguish or shorten the survival clause. This can only be done by consent. So if negotiations for a replacement treaty start, but then don't go ahead or are discontinued, it may be more difficult for the parties to agree to address the survival clause, meaning that the terminated treaty could still be used to bring claims against the state um, for the period of that survival clause, be it 10 or 15 years. So just something to be aware of with this combination of unilateral termination with a replacement treaty if the replacement treaty negotiations um, don't go ahead the next combination of options is unilateral termination without a replacement treaty. So this option is um, available for states to use in a number of different ways. Um, it could be used by a state who has initially attempted to agree uh, to terminate by consent um, or has attempted to, to get an agreement to terminate by consent where there is a termination window running. Um, and if those attempts to, to agree to terminate have failed or if the termination window is getting very close to closing, then the state can keep this option in their back pocket and uh, should the terms of the treaty allow, unilaterally terminate instead of terminating by consent. And this type of option um, is a particularly relevant for those states who have an express policy of phasing out their stock of bits um, and exiting the international investment protection system in favour of more domestic options. Um, and it's also relevant for states who haven't perhaps yet completed their bit reform processes. Uh, and so they may be wishing, or, or alternatively, they may have recently developed a new bit policy or a model and they might want to avoid the pressure to negotiate um, a new treaty with a partner who may not have aligned policies. Um, and this was the option that was used in respect of uh, India and Ecuador's um, unilateral terminations without new replacement treaties that Susie raised in her presentation. Um, but it is important to flag a key risk with this option. As, as noted previously, you cannot unilaterally extinguish or shorten the survival clause. That always has to be done by consent, even if the treaty was not terminated by consent. And it might be harder to do so in a context where one of the states has unilaterally terminated um, it can be more challenging to reach this agreement that's necessary. And so uh, you might have a situation where the old treaty has been terminated, but the survival clause gives it an additional 10 or 15 years of, of legal effect. So this is a really important drawback that states uh, who are looking at unilateral termination without a new treaty will need to keep uh, in mind and to weigh up when considering using this particular option. As a final option that could potentially be used uh, in parallel with some of the previous options that I've shared, um, there is multilateral termination, and that could be used in several different ways. Um, one of which could be in the context of um, a regional economic community, um, which is negotiating a new investment instrument that will govern investment flows amongst the state parties. So for instance, in the African Continental Free Trade Area Investment Protocol, um, this agreement, this protocol could have a provision which effectively terminates the existing bits between the members um, of the African Union. 
as a way of um, addressing potential for overlapping or inconsistent um, investment related provisions and commitments between the states. Um, another way it, uh, the multilateral termination is being used is um, in the context of the EU. Uh, the EU is currently working on a instrument which will be a treaty whose sole purpose is to terminate the existing bits between EU member states. Um, and the benefit of this approach, um, of this multilateral approach, is that it avoids the need for multi multiple individual um, or bilateral terminations and renegotiations. So it's, it's a more effective and more efficient option. Finally, um, multilateral termination could also be used as an option in the context of the UNCTRAL Working Group 3, um, which is currently looking at ISDS reform, um, where there are numerous states who wish to use termination of old treaties as their um, method of reforming their older treaty stock. Um, they could agree to negotiate um, a similar type of termination instrument um, as what the EU are currently developing, um, which could be used to effectively and efficiently terminate um, the bits between those states. Finally, um, regardless of the combination of options that a state have chosen, or a state has chosen rather, um, as we've mentioned several times, the survival clause needs to be addressed and it can't be done so unilaterally. So regardless of whether the termination has been done by consent or unilaterally, the states need to reach an agreement on how to address the survival clause of the old treaty. And it's really important to make sure that this is done because letting a survival clause of 10 or 15 years run on an old style bit can really undermine the reform process um, that the state has in mind when using termination. Um, so it's really critical that some type of agreement on the survival clause is reached. And there are different options for states um, when thinking about how to address the survival clause. They can immediately extinguish it. They can shorten it. So for example, for two to five years or in, instead of 10 or 15. Um, or they can even consider keeping the survival clause but carving out some of the most problematic provisions in the treaty from the operation of that survival clause. So for instance, access to ISDS, they could carve out and leave only state to state dispute settlement under the treaty. Or they could even look at trying to carve out some of the substantive provisions that are the most problematic, such as fair and equitable treatment. There's one last point of strategy, which is important for states to keep in mind when weighing up their options. And that is that the other state, so the state receiving the termination notice, may be more likely to agree to address the survival clause in the old treaty when that termination notice or request for termination comes along with an offer to negotiate a replacement treaty. So states may need to weigh up two potential scenarios when they're thinking about whether or not to offer to negotiate a new treaty. Uh, the first scenario might be that they unilaterally terminate the old treaty, but by unilaterally terminating, they weren't able to reach an agreed position on how to address the, the survival clause. And so the survival clause continues um, for another 10 or 15 years, allowing established investors to bring claims under the terms of that old treaty. So that could be one option. And then the other option would be um, that they terminate the old treaty by consent and negotiate a new treaty, um, which has more pro-sustainable development language, which contains more of the modern uh, exceptions and carve-outs to protect state policy space. And that new treaty also is able to extinguish the survival clause of the old treaty. So it may be for a state who would generally rather not enter into a new treaty, that actually doing so could be better 
then terminating unilaterally, leaving the old treaty survival clause in place for 10 or 15 years. So this is something for states to consider, particularly if they do think that they would be able to negotiate a better, more modern, more pro-sustainable development treaty. Finally, there are two ways um, that states can think about putting in place systems um, to ensure that terminations can be handled more smoothly and more easily in the future. So in the immediate term, states can put in place a simple tracking system to keep on top of key dates that relate to each individual treaty. So this would include things like when the treaty entered into force, um, the next window that will open allowing the state to terminate the treaty if applicable, so in the context of treaties that have a tacit renewal termination clause, um, what is the date of expiry of the treaty, um, and what is the date that the survival clause, if left running, would also expire. So keeping in track, keeping track of these key dates can help uh, states make sure that they know when they can send a, a notice for unilateral termination and to ensure that they don't miss a window for termination. And then looking more into the future, states can think about ways that they might like to reform new treaties where they are in continuing to engage in new negotiations. Um, they might like to think about some of the new approaches that states have been taking to drafting termination and survival clauses. Um, so Susie touched on some of these um, options, um, but one of them would be to have a treaty without a fixed term, which allows for unilateral termination by either state at any time. And this option we see in the current Canadian model bit, Another option can be for what we're calling tacit termination. This is seen in the Indian model, and this really reverses the situation of tacit renewal and says that after a certain fixed period, unless the parties otherwise agree to continue the treaty, it will automatically terminate. So this really requires both parties to think about um, what benefits they might, might have received under the treaty and make a positive step towards continuing its operation as opposed to um, having that continued operation be tacit or automatic. Um, some states have agreed new treaties that have no survival clause, for instance, Nigeria and Morocco, and then others have uh, had treaties with much shorter survival periods, such as in the Indian model bit, um, which only has a five-year survival clause. So these are some of the options that states who are continuing to, term to negotiate new treaties could consider. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, I would just like to invite you to read the paper entitled Terminating a Bilateral Investment Treaty um, that is part of our Best Practices series and is currently available on the IISD website. Um, it contains further details, drafting language, um, more examples and references um, for any of those details that you might have missed from this webinar. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, so hopefully we can, we can continue and we have 15 minutes to answer uh, some of the questions that have come through. So one of the questions I wanted to uh, start with is very much the question about lack uh, of clarity. Let me just find this one again. We had, we had a question about the lack of clarity in, uh, and alignment between BITS and regional uh, initiatives, as well as uh, other uh, competing uh, free trade agreements and uh, what could be done to streamline and make uh, these relationships a little bit clearer. Uh, 
And I think I'd like to invite uh, Hamid to briefly respond to that. Yes, uh, thank you, Natalie. Um, that's a, a very important question, especially from a developing country perspective. Um, it's where to start. Uh, there are so many uh, reform efforts happening at different levels. Uh, there are countries that uh, are big and powerful and they set the standard, they can reform, they can go ahead. Uh, but of course, it's not the same for everyone. Uh, now for smaller countries that wish to reform their investment uh, regime, it's very important to start uh, by having a national uh, investment policy vision, for example. We often have countries that adopt uh, an investment law that unfortunately it's, it's not really a law, it's, it's a big pack of incentives and, uh, and gifts uh, to throw left and right to foreign investors and then this is called a law. Uh, but anyway, the first thing to do is really to have a, a coherent uh, investment policy vision, starting with a robust, modern uh, national investment uh, law, um, and then to ensure a coherence between this law and the investment uh, treaties and obligations, uh, and also the, the, the contracts between a ministry and uh, a foreign investor, for example. This can be done by establishing, uh, for example, a task force, interministerial task force in the developing country, uh, where ministries talk to each other, including the central bank, the investment promotion agency, uh, talk to each other to formulate this vision. What do we want to do with investment? What kind of regulations do we want? Um, and, and starting from, from this building block, uh, then build on it your uh, legal framework, uh, starting nationally and then your international treaties. Um, I think something that's very useful also is the development of a model treaty, um, because that would help uh, in any kind of international negotiations even though it is called the Model Bilateral Investment Treaty, it will help the country in its bilateral and regional and multilateral or plurilateral negotiations. This document would uh, allow the negotiators of this country to go into negotiations feeling really sure what is the position of my country. Unfortunately, many developing countries go into the negotiations of these treaties um, without such a model and without uh, fully un knowing uh, what the national legislation is, what are the priorities, the objectives. Sometimes negotiations happen in a rush. There are also a lot of power dynamics pulling left and right. And at the end, a document is signed and is ratified. And unfortunately, often is not in line with the country's uh, strategies and priorities. So I would start with designing a model bit and um, establishing a task force that has the, has an, the only um, job is to ensure that the investment policy throughout the country and at all levels uh, are coherent with each other. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and, and I'd like to just invite to, on top of this uh, explanation, speaking very much about uh, getting a, a national vision and strategy. Susie, did you want to um, add something in terms of the relationship, for example, uh, for intra-regional arrangements? Because we had one of the questions that said, uh, from the presentation, I understand that there is lack of clarity, uniformity, or alignment of the systems available for states. For example, BITS versus ISDS, multilateral and African uh, continental free trade agreement, intra-regional arrangements. So that relationship that comes up again and again between BITS and uh, regionals. Uh, could you expand a little bit on that? Uh, yes, thank you, Natalie. This is a, a very important uh, question, uh, specifically if we take the context of, of uh, Africa Union, uh, but it's also relevant for other regions. So it's true that we have this issue of uh, intra-BITs because uh, when you are part of a regional organization or a, a continental organization, 
um, but at the same, and where we are negotiating some regional instrument, but at, at the same time, you have bilateral investment treaties or are still negotiating one among yourselves, this can bring incoherence and inconsistency. Uh, so the inconsistency can be at three level. First, between the bilateral investment treaties among the member states and the regional in the instrument, because we have some regional organizations such as uh, the ECOWAS, uh, COMESA, SADEC, for those who are familiar with these acronyms in Africa. And all of these uh, regions have some kind of models or, or regional treaties governing uh, investment treaties, uh, investment uh, uh, regulation. So this is the first level of risk of challenge or inconsistencies. Then you have also another layer of risk of inconsistency is between different uh, instruments at regional level. Because again here, some regional organization have two or three instruments regulating investment and they are not always fully aligned. So this is a very important uh, question also to consider and to try to address. And a third point, uh, a third level of risk of inconsistency is between uh, both the bilateral level and the regional level with the continental level. And here we have this negotiation going on at the African Union level where an investment protocol should be negotiated in the next uh, weeks or, or months, uh, hopefully. And this raises the importance of how African, uh, Africa Union states, member states, can bring more coherence and alignment between the bilateral, the regional, and the continental level. And this is where maybe termination can be an interesting option to consider, uh, because if, you, if the member states decide to conclude a continental agreement on investment, and we still have to see if this is, uh, uh, treaty will cover only uh, investment flows within the member state or uh, investment flows from third states. This is one question, but whatever is the option, uh, it's important to deal with the old stock of BITs at national and regional, uh, at bilateral, sorry, and regional level. So country can decide, for example, when they conclude the treaty, to uh, automatically, for example, terminate at least all bilateral treaties among the member states because this uh, avoids a duplication with the new continental instrument. Regarding the regional instrument, it can be more complicated, but it's, it's also important to ensure at least some alignment between those regional instruments and the continental level instrument to make sure they are complementary or at least they, they speak each to, um, uh, to either, to over, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that and, and this interrelationship uh, uh, between bilateral and regional negotiations and, and that as, unless you want a, a real noodle bowl or spaghetti bowl, you, you really need to think about terminating some and doing it properly in a way that, uh, that makes uh, sense and that legally, uh, is sound. I have another question, and I don't think we need to answer it now, but I just want to mention it. Uh, of the countries that have terminated, how many have had the survival clause leading to claims? So I think that we probably on this panel can't answer that question, how many cases have been brought uh, under, uh, under treaties that have been terminated. We do know that there are cases uh, under the survival clause that, uh, that have uh, been brought. And so unless Hamed, who is the guarantor in, in of the uh, of all the, the, the data, uh, unless you can say a number now, uh, Hamed, I think I would suggest that you go back uh, to your database uh, and maybe we can inform uh, the participants later on, on the number of cases brought uh, under, the, under this clause. Um, another uh, interesting question, can you clarify uh, on unilateral premature terminations what kind of claim is the state is exposed to? 
So my understanding of this question is, uh, if you uh, terminate before uh, the, you're, you're legally permitted under international law and under the treaty, what would happen if you did terminate uh, before? Does somebody want to answer that? Maybe, Sarah, if your line is okay, maybe I can invite mm -hmm. you to answer the question. So interpreting the question, um, the, the premature element of the question um, to mean in the example of a, um, a treaty with a 10-year initial term, um, if one of the parties attempted to unilaterally terminate the treaty at the eight-year mark, um, we would need to look to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which Susie mentioned in her um, presentation. And under the Vienna Convention, there are only two lawful ways for a state to terminate a treaty. Uh, the first is at any time by mutual consent, uh, and the second is under the terms of the treaty itself. So if the treaty provided for an initial 10-year term and only allowed for unilateral termination after the 10 years, then an attempt for one by one state to terminate that treaty unilaterally at the eight-year mark would not be considered lawful. And so a situation could arise where a state attempts to unilaterally terminate prematurely or um, before the first term of the treaty had run. Um, if an investor brought a claim in that context, then the tribunal could look at the term of the treaty uh, and decide that they, in fact, do have jurisdiction over that complaint, over that claim, um, because the termination was not lawful and was not done in accordance with the terms of the treaty. So the, so the consequence would be that uh, the termination is simply uh, not effective and the investor can continue br to bring a, a, a case uh, because it hasn't been terminated. Uh, I guess the question would be, if you did this early, would it then automatically count uh, for a later uh, termination that would be after the 10 years? Um, but maybe that goes a little bit into too much detail, but certainly uh, the, what you're saying uh, is is obviously um, a consequence that it's ineffective the termination and ISDS cases can continue to be brought and probably also you could have uh, a state-to-state -state, uh, dispute that would just um, uh, maybe go to arbitration to uh, acknowledge that this uh, this termination is is not valid and, and effective uh, but uh, it is. It, it it doesn't really help, and it might even um, be a problem in terms of uh, a later uh, the termination that you would maybe then uh, miss in terms of the actual uh, termination window. Um, on the other hand, uh, maybe I just want to mention this, but there is uh, the idea of a unilateral um, statement that uh, you. You, you are not giving consent to future cases. Uh, so that would be construed as something a bit different from termination, but you're retracting consent. Uh, but uh, whether that uh, has legal consequences also not, not so clear. So um, that would be for another discussion uh, another time. Um, I think that unfortunately we are running out of time, but we have quite a few questions here that we will uh, happily answer uh, bilaterally because, uh, and, and maybe also make some of them public in a report uh, about this seminar and this discussion and Q&A. Be sure that you will hear from us if uh, I wasn't able to, to, to read your question now. And I want to thank everybody for joining and I wish you all the best in this time of crisis uh, that your families and your, your, your friends stay safe and do take seriously the recommendations of your government to stay at home and uh, be careful not to get infected yourself, but also not to uh, infect others because you may not know that you are actually carrying the virus.
So thank you very much for joining and we will be in touch and we hope you will join again at our next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.